Good afternoon, everybody. It is six o'clock, but as Councillor Stephen has just stepped out to quickly grab something, we currently don't have quorum. So we're going to wait for her to come back and then we can get the meeting started. Thank you for your patience. Okay, so it is uh, just after six o'clock and I can confirm we do indeed have quorum and uh, happy to turn it over to you, Mr. Chair, to begin the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, so meeting is called to order. Uh, first item on the agenda is approval of the agenda, of the agenda with the addendum. Do I have a mover and seconder? Councillor Stephen, Deputy Mayor Don. <laughs> Okay. Lisa, Councillor Sanic, I'm just waiting for Councillor Rich to take his seat. You're welcome. Okay, call vote on the ag agenda. All in favor? That's passed unanimously. Confirmation of minutes. If we could get a mover and a seconder on that one. Deputy Mayor. Councillor Rich. All those in favor? Passed unanimously. Uh, are there any, disclo any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. Uh, there are no delegations. No briefings. Uh, item number seven, business. <clears throat> item A, updates on public art policy to outline process and guidelines for the mural of private property. To be introduced by staff. Colin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and through you, Councillor Shaves, I'm pleased to be here this evening on behalf of Arts, Arts and Culture Services, and I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Dana Kalahid, who's the Manager of Arts and Sector Development, and Taylor Norris, who's our Public Art Coordinator. And the two of them have certainly done the heavy lifting on this report, and we're going to be happy to answer questions that may arise. Uh, but just by quick way of introduction, as outlined in the report, uh, there's certainly been an increasing level of interest in the idea of murals in Kingston. Uh, it's something that we've seen going back a number of decades in select locations. Uh, but it is an interest that's ramped up in more recent times, perhaps partly due to the work of the city in relation to some of our initiatives in the public art portfolio. But we're also seeing businesses in Kingston adopt murals as a way to bring attention to their uh, operations. Uh, we've also been receiving an increasing number of requests from the public uh, for the idea of doing murals on private property. The challenge being at this point that we don't have a mechanism through which to approve those. Uh, right now, the way bylaws are written, uh, they don't necessarily enable this opportunity. Uh, and even though I, in my role as the Director of Arts and Culture Services, have the ability to revise the public art policy with Council's approval, uh, we do not, as staff, have the ability to make any amendments to bylaws to which the policy actually relates. So the purpose of the report before you tonight is to outline the interest that's been expressed and to propose a process that we as staff are recommending uh, in relation to revisions to the public art policy that would enable the creation of murals on private property in tandem with small adjustments to two of our uh, municipal bylaws as identified. And certainly we're happy, as I say, uh, to answer questions in relation to what's being proposed before you today. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Councillor Stephen. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair, thank you very much for sharing this with us. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first one is related to heritage properties. Uh, does 
staff have the opinion that this is cautious enough. I know we've received some correspondence um, suggesting that, I believe it's limestone and brick, uh, might be a little more delicate. Is, could you speak to that for us, please? Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. Absolutely, the issues raised in the correspondence that was received this afternoon definitely aligns with topics that we've discussed. And uh, we have had the opportunity to have some discussion with the Heritage Committee about what's being proposed because uh, in tandem with this report coming forward, there has been a request for a, a mural on a private property at 168 Wellington Street, which is also identified in that letter. Uh, so what I would say is that uh, my read of the letter is that the, the concerns that have been raised are actually related to what I would consider to be part of the, the um, character defining attributes of a heritage building. And so therefore would be part of the discussion uh, when a request like this is brought forward to the heritage committee as part of a heritage permitting per process. And that, uh, you know, that process would ensure that there was no impacts negatively on those kinds of aspects of a building, including their materials and the way those materials have been used in terms of design elements. Okay, so if I'm understanding correctly, when it's a heritage property, privately owned, it would also go to Heritage Committee. There's that extra layer in there of oversight, is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, that's absolutely correct. And it's been very clearly identified in the process that we've laid out that we would hope that an applicant in pursuing this process would understand that uh, they might be dealing with a heritage uh, building, at which point we would be able to direct them to need to seek a heritage permit. Uh, if they came forward with an application just straight to us with the components as outlined, at that opportunity we'd be able to identify that actually what they're dealing with is a heritage building, which would then result in us directing them to request a heritage permit. And we are also uh, identifying through this process that any heritage building with a mural on it also builds in an opportunity for a design to then be brought back to Heritage Committee uh, for their review and consideration, recognizing that they don't have um, the ability to uh, veto the design, but they can provide input. Thank you. I'm sure other councillors have questions about that topic, but I'm going to move on for myself. Um, wondering if you could speak to existing murals on public property. Thank you. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is something, well, for those of you who've grown up in the, the West End, and I'm... Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry to interrupt. I meant pub, uh, existing murals on private property. Yes. Yes, okay, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Through you. Um, I was just going to identify that having grown up in Henderson Place, uh, I'm very familiar with the mural that's on the Svensson Brothers building at Front and Days Road. I mean, that's a very long-standing example of a mural on private property. Uh, and then we have seen more recently ones appear on some local businesses such as Daft Brewery, Frontenac Cycle. Uh, there's one on a convenience store on Concession Street. Right now, those would technically be in contravention of the bylaws as, as described. And so part of bringing this process forward is also to give us a mechanism through which we can go back retroactively, contact those uh, private property owners, and then move through a process of retroactively approving those murals. Um, are you aware of any that will need to be retroactively disapproved? For you, uh, Councillor Shaves as chair, I, I am not aware of any. We did, through the public engagement that we did in relation to this proposed policy change, ask people to identify murals uh, through the Get Involved platform, and there was none that were identified that I think we would consider to be uh, problematic. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I haven't been going through you. Through you, Mr. Chair. Do I still have time? Well, I thought you actually had given up your time and was passing on to other councillors. Okay, fine. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Amos. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you. Um, I, know, I know the letter that we received uh, expressed concern in regards to uh, murals specifically going on heritage buildings, but also uh, part of the letter expressed concerns about um, the amount of murals going in one section of the city. I know in the report it said that uh, the idea or the premise was to move murals, or not move them, but have murals go through various aspects of the city. Is there, is there a weighted scale for various 
sections of the city. You know, there's a downtown where there's a lot of tourists, a lot of uh, engagement from the public and from residents. Uh, is the idea to put more downtown, or is it is it kind of open? Uh, through you, Councillor Shaves, as chair, I'm, there is the mechanism in place, and I'll let my colleague Dana Kalahi speak to this in a bit more detail. But uh, with the pro the public art on public properties working group, uh, you know, they are a body that we work with in relation to the the administration of that policy, and those are criteria that are set out in terms of the distribution of public art across. The community, so I presume that that is something that they would uh, consider in relation to a submission that comes in. But I'll ask uh, Ms. Lahi to, mm -hmm. to elaborate on that. Uh, thank you, Colin. Um, yeah, just to build on that a little bit, um, the the public art policy is very much focused on spreading public art across the city of Kingston, and and through our own public art program, we have focused on areas outside of the downtown core. Um, that will then translate to this program, and a lot of the requests we've had are actually quite balanced. There is a lot of interest for downtown Kingston and sort of the surrounding areas uh, for the reasons that you've mentioned, but there's also a lot of interest across other neighborhoods in Kingston, um, and it will be part of you know, our ongoing review process of the applications to pay close attention to um, obviously the quality of the murals, but also the quantity. So we don't have an established um, number of murals that we want to see in these neighborhoods, but we will be um, considering that, especially in proximity to each other. You know, this is something that we also wanted to try to address through establishing a more open application process is to hopefully avoid that um, and to be able to, you know, note to applicants if their mural is beside another mural or there's sort of a bit of a cluster happening um, to try and balance it out a little bit more. Thank you. I bring that forward a little bit. One, to protect the downtown because I think it's important to have artwork obviously in, in high volume areas. Um, but I also see a tourism opportunity to be spread out throughout the whole city of Kingston where uh, families, uh, if given a map or something like that, could uh, necessarily uh, explore the city to find out where all the murals are. I just think there's a huge opportunity for exploration for families to enjoy uh, what is being put forward. Um, what's the vetting process? Because I, I read that uh, in the report, we want our artists to be bold. We want them to uh, bring items. And, you know, the word controversial was, was not talked about, but it was hinted. Um, not necessarily controversial, but to be bold and brave and, and be... Uh, with our murals, and can you walk me through the vetting process of what that would be? Because, you know, there's there's just some murals that would not be appropriate to go up. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I mean, again, we're really relying on the established criteria through our public art policy that was approved by council back in 2015, which does identify eligibility criteria and assessment criteria for any public artwork commissioned through the city of Kingston. And so we're really adopting those criteria pieces in terms of appropriateness of content, um, responsiveness to the site, sort of those types of considerations that need to come into play. Um, we also have in the guidelines for this um, murals on private property ineligible content. So there will be, uh, a, there is a list of content that the, the staff, but also the Art and Public Places Working Group will look at. And if there is any offensive material, uh, if there's any sort of branding or advertising, those items will automatically make the mural ineligible to be approved through that process. Through you, Mr. Chair. I only have one more. Um, I thought I read in the report that a mural's length would be two years. Is that, uh, is that correct? And if it's, if it's not two years or if it is two years, can you elaborate on what's the mechanism for a mural to stay longer than that? Because I know that uh, on my way to work, I, I drive through Councillor Stevens' area and, and the Svensson Brothers mural has been there a very long time, is in excellent shape. Um, and it, I don't know if it's been ever updated or refreshed, but it, it, it's definitely been there longer than two years. So I'm just wondering what the, what the aspect is on, on length of service, I guess. 
Thank you, and to you, Mr. Chair. So we included a minimum timeline of two years to ensure that the murals that come in have a potential to have an impact for people to experience them and enjoy them. And it sort of creates a minimum lifespan of murals and puts onus on the property owners to maintain it to the standard at which it was, when it was first installed. Um, any murals that go beyond that, of course, are welcome. Uh, but as part of this process, we will be working with property owners to uh, develop maintenance manuals. So they will be responsible for really developing this and sharing that with us to sort of demonstrate that they have understanding and capacity about how to maintain them. Because again, while they're on private property, many of these properties are adjacent to the public realm. They're able to be experienced in that way. And so that preservation of the quality of the mural um, is also a key factor for us to supporting these types of, of mural projects. Um, so again, the two-year minimum is just that, but the maintenance manual and the ongoing care of the murals is something that we will be supportive of if uh, applicants wish to maintain it for longer periods of time. Thank you. Councillor Osadek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll throw you some questions to staff. Um, I see like we have some concerns too about um, <laughs> what Councillor Amos was just talking about, like the maintenance of it. So if um, like maybe the person who has the private, you know, mural, maybe they think it's okay, but other people in the neighborhood think that, um, like, it's looking kind of grubby. So um, would someone from the public then email staff or, like, email contact us and then contact us, looks to staff, you know, um, if it starts to, to look really worn out? Uh, thank you and to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for that question. So there will be uh, a public art at cityofkingston.ca email that anyone can always reach out to um, to let us know about any concerns that they may have. And I think that is true of this uh, situation as well. Um, in that scenario, if someone wrote to us and identified that a mural was um, not being upkept uh, or had sort of comments, if we go through this process, we're also then able to reach out to the property owner to notify them of this and, and uh, review basically what their options are to go forward. The city of Kingston will not be responsible for the maintenance of murals on private property, so that would fall on the property owner. Uh, but depending on you know, if this is an existing mural that has to be sanctioned retro retroactively or if it's a new mural and in two years we come across this, uh, that's something that certainly the public can reach out to us about and we can connect directly with the property owner. Thank you. Um, what do we know about how well like old paints, like say, say a mural is on a wall for several years? Um, what do we know about how easy it is to be removed from limestone, um, other types of stone after several years? Um, it looks like you have to use paint stripper, which we know is very toxic to the environment. Uh, thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as part of this process, uh, we are going to be including a toolkit uh, for any applicant that is interested in installing a mural. And as part of that toolkit, all of this will be addressed in terms of providing guidance and direction in terms of things like how to prep the site effectively so that murals can be maintained for longer periods of time, uh, the appropriate and better types of paint and other sort of materials for that sustainability piece, and then as well the, the cleaning and or the removal process. I think what's really important as part of this um, new process is that you know, murals are inherently temporary and removable. And so they're, you know, depending on the, the surface, depending on the paints used, uh, there are various ways in which removal and maintenance of a surface can be, can be done. And that is something that we're intending to provide as, you know, based on our expertise and primarily through uh, my colleague Taylor Norris here this evening as well. Um, and we will be available to support property owners if that situation arises. Thank you. Thank you for answering those questions. Um, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, um, I'd like to uh, propose an amendment because I do have the... Oh. 
Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the uh, motion is currently not on the floor, so we can't uh, we can't move motions to amend. Can't, but yeah. Any further questions, Councillor Sanic? Councillor Rich, do you have any other questions? <clears throat> um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you, uh, I don't have any particular questions. I I just wanted to to point to. Uh, I think that I think that there in the feedback that was in the report, there were some several really interesting comments, and I kind of agree with them in terms of the vibrancy and, and making these spaces uh, seem newer and more inviting. Uh, I I understand the concerns about the heritage properties as they were put forward, but it sounds like that's in, that's in, under control, or uh, maybe with the introduction of a an amendment to this motion, uh, it will be under more control. Um, so my concerns are minimal based off of that. I, I did love the, I do want to put in the public record that one piece, the under concerns, it said none, get jiggy with it. And I, I think that that needs to be in the public record. So thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you. Mr. Clerk, can we have that for the record? Thank you, sir. We can move forward with the second round of questions. Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, as someone who's new to policy like this, why is staff bringing this as a complete policy change as opposed to a pilot project? What's the rationale? Like, why is it not a pilot project? Thank you. Through you, Councillor Shaves, as chair, I think the feeling was on our part that um, because we have the ability to to amend the the public art policy, and we've been able to go through um, some different scenarios like this, we did do a very rigorous pilot project with the street art legal wall that's down in in Doug Floor Park, and and we're able to get good feedback on that, uh, and that we have not seen any. Uh, complaints come forward in relation to any of the existing murals and that we have seen a significant amount of interest on the part of many players over quite a while, not just you know more recently, but it has also been a topic of discussion within the, the Art and Public Places Working Group for a while too, that the momentum seemed to direct us towards moving forward with this, but we have built into the report uh, the clause about the, the need to report back uh, in 2024, because we also see that you know, we, we need to find out how this is actually gonna play out in reality. So uh, you know, in some ways it is a pilot project in the sense that we will have the opportunity when we assess what happens over the coming year and report back that um, we can make adjustments if necessary at that time. Thank you. Your second part to your response was my next question. So yeah, I, I agree. Reporting back to this committee, I think, covers that base, in my opinion, um, in a year's time. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, Vice Chair Amos, would you take the chair? I have the chair and recognize you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Um, just to further on Councillor Sanek's comment about uh, comments from the public concerns, would they be able to use contact us as well? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Arts and Culture Services has recently been onboarded into the CRM system, and this is one of the things that we've identified as, as being an area where people can use the contact us mechanism to, to reach out through. Okay, thank you. Uh, one further question, just in regards to ownership. Um, with, especially with regards to public property, city property, would there be a waiver that uh, artists would have to sign off on the ownership of their art? Uh, thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so in terms of murals on public property, those are owned by the city of Kingston. Um, those are murals that you know we would commission um, and, and maintain ownership of and therefore be required to maintain it. For murals on private property, the ownership would exclusively lie with the property owner. So the city would have no ownership uh, of those murals. I understand. I'm just wondering in regards to if the artist decides to state that they would like their art back, 
And I've come across this, my other employment, which basically would come, could come down to removing that portion of the wall in order to give it to them. Uh, thank you to you, Mr. Chair. So I think I'm, I'm understanding, um, you know, the, the recommendation and, and what's included in the guidelines um, for murals on private property would be to recommend that property owners work with the artists to develop a letter of agreement that would outline the parameters for this project. Um, because it's a mural, again, if we're using the example of painted directly to the surface, um, the only way that that mural, mural would be removed if there was a decision made by the property owner um, to remove it in, from its entirety from the surface. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question completely. But. Slightly. But I'm more concerned in regards to the city property. You did, you did mention it would be commissioned by the city, mm -hmm. but just in case there's a legal um, issue, which they may pop up, which possibly could, I'm just wondering, in order to cover the basis legally for the city, that someone may just turn around and say, I would like that back. And then legally, we may have to if there's nothing signed, such as a waiver. Through you, Mr. Chair, I think if I'm understanding the question, when we do a commissioning of an artist in any form uh, through the public art program, the ownership of that work transfers to the city of Kingston, including uh, the, well, the, the, the artist maintains sort of the moral rights and, and image rights, but the actual ownership of the work belongs to the city of Kingston, and it is then considered part of the civic collection under the civic collection policy. So the ownership does transfer. Okay, thank you, just wanna make sure. You have the chair. Thank you, sir. Any further questions from the committee? Deputy Mayor Amos. Mr. Chair, and through you, um, we've been talking, uh, all of us, in, uh, under the assumption that all of the murals are being painted on brick or, or material, solid material like walls. Um, I'm, that wouldn't be the assumption, though, would it? Like, there's other ways to do this as well. Yes, thank you and through you, Mr. Chair, absolutely. Um, so the obvious, very common way is to paint uh, murals directly to a surface, uh, but there's also mechanisms to affix panels uh, to different wall surfaces. Um, so there's a couple of options there that depending on the, the scale of the mural, the, the surface itself, um, there's a few different ways to sort of go about that. And all of this falls into the toolbox criteria of everything that's been set up by the, by the staff? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Any other further questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, we'll move to the public. I see we have some in Zoom, and we have one in person. Uh, Mr. Chair, we'll do the, let's do the Zoom one first, and then we can do it in person. Okay. Uh, I recognize Shirley Bailey. Ms. Bailey, you have the floor. You have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to the committee this evening, and I'm hoping that you can hear me okay. Um, I, 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 it's quite clear from the conversation thus far that um, you've received the correspondence and because of many of the questions that have gone back and forth. And I appreciate Mr. Biggington's comments, but I think he may misunderstand that we, uh, the foundation is not just concerned about heritage designated properties, but we are also concerned about um, specific areas of the city where there is a high concentration of properties that may be listed um, and have potential for designation. I had asked the clerk if he could perhaps um, put up the slide that was included in the letter, in my letter on the third page. It's just so, so small, it's really difficult to tell. But just so you understand the kind of area that we at the foundation are talking about, the blue line on this map is the central business district. So it's quite large. And um, the building at 168 Wellington is within this area. The new mural up on division is outside the central business district. Then within that, sort of a half block north and south of Princess down to the water, you have what's called the Lower Princess Street Heritage Character Area. We have, I think it's nine heritage character areas in the city's recognized
recognized in the city's official plan. This one's considered to be a significant cultural heritage resource, as you can imagine, many of the buildings have been built in sort of the mid 1800s. So we're really here tonight to put a plea to the committee to perhaps put a, an extra safety factor in for the buildings that are located within this area. You have about uh, 24 of them, uh, which are listed, and you may have heard from heritage uh, staff, heritage planning staff, that they are basically under the gun over the next two years to review all listed properties, all 300 listed properties across the city to determine whether they should be designated. And if they are not designated within that time frame, they fall off the register. So, um, it, and as you can see on this map, the orange properties are already designated. So there's quite a concentration of those. But in, you know, we've long had the hope that this area would be considered to be a heritage district at some point, possibly by enlarging the Market Square Heritage District. I'm not sure. But we really uh, make this plea to the committee tonight that in this area in particular, we need to be extremely careful about applying murals directly onto paint or onto limestone. And I realize that there are you know, ways to rem remove them. But as we've heard from Bruce Downey, who was in the business for 40 years, um, there it's much better to put these things on a panel that is then attached somehow to a surface with a spacer so that there's some breathing that can happen. So uh, perhaps this can be addressed through the toolkit. We've had no input into the toolkit, but again, our, our big concern is, you know, we are going from not allowing these on private properties to now allowing them it appears uh, across the entire municipality. So it's a good thing, but we just need to be cautious about how we proceed with it. Thank you. Do we have anyone else, Mr. Clerk? We have no one else on Zoom, but I do believe there is a member of the public in chamber. You have the floor and you have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Thanks for the report and the presentations from staff and the questions and answers. Um, I've learned a lot. Excellent quality work. Um, questions I have um, are maybe a little bit outside the realm so far. Um, the director mentioned the uh, wall in Doug Fir Park. And for a while there was a contest uh, on to, um, I think it was in August every year, to have artists uh, able to show their work there, and it would then basically expire over the course of the next year or two. And then photographs were taken of it uh, for the record, and then the next contest was held. So uh, number one is I'm wondering that contest is still going on. Um, I thought it was very successful. Um, used the resource that was already there um, in a beneficial way. Um, my next question has to do with shall we say, the non-paint um, or application side, but the actual projection side of a, of a mural. So it's as possible as well. Um, and I know that the west side of Princess Towers has been talked about as a site for that in the past. Um, it's a bit of a drab building, um, very large area, and can be seen from quite a distance of Princess Street. So I'm not sure where that stands, but um, I would be supportive of that. Um, as a projection um, onto the uh, wall, and then that could be changed every year or two. So I'm not sure if that's addressed in the report, but uh, I think it, it needs to be discussed. Um, and then my, my final question has to do with a mural that once existed downtown, but no longer does. And it was on the side of the parking garage on Brock Street. And for those who are not, not familiar with it, um, I found this very interesting. Um, it was a bit of a history of Kingston from sort of the last thousand years or so in a sort of microcosm. I'm not sure how many panels there were. Um, I think they were created by a Berryfield group um, and then actually presented to the city and they were there for quite a while and then over time the, the, the condition of the mural uh, went down and then they were taken off. And I understand they're still stored somewhere so what I'm wondering is, with our increasingly sensitive 
um, understanding of history as seen by others, not necessarily European settlers, but First Nations and so forth. I'm wondering if something like that were to be recreated, it would have to undergo more of a, a scrutiny than maybe happened in the past, right? Because you have people in First Nations being portrayed a certain way, and you know they may object to that and so forth. So I, I found that those murals interesting. I think they were an attraction, but I'd be supportive of something like that, again, maybe on the same site or elsewhere, or if they could be shown again somehow. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clark, do we have anyone else in Zoom? Through you, Mr. Chair, we do not. Okay. Uh, if we get staff to uh, answer those questions. Please. Yes, and through you, um, Mr. Chair, uh, the first question related to the contesting on the Doug Fleur Park retaining wall, uh, that was actually the initiative that led to that uh, wall being transformed into the legal wall. That initiative was done over two different years by the Friends of Inner Harbor uh, and was done as an opportunity to bring community together through a community event and uh, artists were invited to paint murals on the retaining wall at that time and as you indicated they were documented uh, and it was actually through the efforts of the friends of the inner harbor that the idea came forward to actually then translate that into the, the legal wall uh, we were actually recently contacted by the instigator of that program uh, asking if there might be other opportunities for that kind of mural festival and certainly the way the the legal wall is structured anyone can come along and actually create new murals uh, there because it is there as a, a blank canvas of course painting over what's already there but that is the nature of, of that wall as it was conceived so that's sort of the context for for that question uh, the second question about uh, princess towers obviously a privately owned property uh, and one that we don't control, but I am aware historically there was actually an artist project that involved projections on the side of that wall as a temporary intervention uh, that brought a lot of interest. And there has actually been conversation on the part of staff with that property owner over recent years in relation to a separate project that we did called the Hub Project uh, that uh, is meant to have a, a further phase of activity to develop um, more legacy project down there. So it is something that's still actively on our, our radar as, as something to pursue. And the third question regarding the uh, murals on the side of the Hanson Garage, that was a millennial project at the turn of the century or the millennium. Uh, you are correct, it was a project that was initiated out of a group in Berryfield. Uh, the reason for the removal of those murals a number of years ago, and I don't remember the exact year, uh, was twofold. Uh, the majority of the murals had, um, to the questions raised earlier, had uh, worn and uh, were not uh, retaining uh, their uh, viability. Lots of the paint was lost, lots of the paint was uh, faded by the sun. Uh, so, you know, they had lost their, their vigorousness over the number of years, but also the city had the need to do significant repair work on the Hanson Garage that uh, meant that those murals had to be removed. So I, I know that they were put in storage at some point. Whether they still are in storage is something that I would have to look into. Could you also address Mrs. Bailey's question, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And through you, I, I do appreciate the, the concerns that's been raised. And the uh, thing that comes to mind in terms of the process as we've been looking at it is I know that we've been very specific that something on a designated heritage building would require a heritage permit. But it also seems uh, reasonable to me that as part of this process, we could broaden that requirement uh, to recognize buildings that are listed with the potential of being designated as something that needs to be considered through the process that's been laid out. Okay, thank you. We'll move in second, and then we can go for the questions and comments. So if I could get our, someone to first and second this motion, please. Councillor Stephen. Councillor Ridge. Thank you. Does anyone from the committee have any questions or comments? Deputy Mary Mills. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, it's just one final uh, comment or, or something for staff to consider, and, and you've, you've kind of alluded to it now. In November of last year, uh, I traveled to, uh, to Montreal and wandered through old, old Montreal, and some of their or one of their heritage buildings had a absolutely stunning um, projection mural uh, that was more, it was kind of a video, but it was a mural that uh, encompassed the whole wall, uh, very tastefully done and uh, drew a crowd in to observe. It was usually, a, I think it was a three or four minute video, um, but it was well done to protect the heritage of the building. Um, but the video or the mural was stunning. And, and do we have that allowance in our current toolkit policy for something like that to take place? Uh, thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. So it wasn't something that through the feedback and conversations we've had um, in terms of the interest around this type of process being established, it's been primarily interest around painted murals or murals affixed to um, panels, pan murals installed on panels that are then affixed to the site. Um, certainly, you know, uh, installation and projection is a type of public art form that is also um, very low impact on the surface that it operates in. Um, this is something that we could review. It's not currently included in this amendment to the public art policy in the definition of the mural that we've included, uh, but it's a be, it could be something that we look at perhaps through, after we get through the first sort of phase of this and come back to this committee uh, with an update on how this, prog this project has progressed. Thank you. I think I think there's a medium out there that that were that is a graphic electronic graphic artists would potentially thrive in in, in this community. Um, so it's that would be good if if the staff could review that. Thank you, Councillor Hanick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you, so. I do share um, Ms. Bailey's concern and Mr. Downing's concern about um, what could happen with the Lower Princess Street heritage character area as defined in our city's official plan um, with these murals. And so um, I just wanna propose an amendment that for any murals going in the Lower Princess Street heritage character area that um, they be attached um, to the mortar, not the brick or limestone, and on a panel that is separated from the brick or limestone with a space. So we do have motion on the floor. Moved by Councillor Osanek, second by Councillor Stephen. Do I need to read this? that the public art policy attached to exhibit A to report number ARCP-23-003 be amended by adding the following clause in the appropriate section. The murals in the Lower Princess Heritage character area be attached to the mortar, not the brick or limestone, and on a panel that is separated from the brick or limestone with a space. Councillor Sanek, you have the floor. I think I just described it. Um, it's just to preserve the character. Uh, it's basically, it's just um, I'm worried about what was raised to us um, about maintenance if the mural goes and there's still remnants of the paint on the side of um, of the building. So it's, it's just to help with that once the mural goes. Councillor Stephen. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I seconded this motion because I think it's worth discussing, and we may as well bring it to the floor to have a conversation about this. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not opposed to this amendment, um, but I also kind of question if maybe it's a bit redundant. So I just wanted to ask staff, uh, you know, is this this is done explicitly to address concerns um, from the public? I just want to know, is this something that would be considered anyway, or is yeah, I just want to know what you think, please. 
Through you, Mr. Chair, I, I defer to the expertise of people like Shirley Bailey and Bruce Downey in this regard. Uh, but my understanding is, and um, you know, this is something we've talked about quite a bit, the example of the mural being requested for the building at 168 Wellington Street is actually not a mural on any of the surfaces that involve limestone or brick. It's actually on a sidewall or a side facade that is stuccoed, as I understand it. Uh, so, you know, our concern through the process of bringing designated or listed buildings to the Heritage Committee is that they would have the opportunity uh, to consider the request in relation to the building and be able to, you know, use their authority in that regard to direct or guide um, what is being requested at that time rather than uh, putting it in, in the way that is being suggested perhaps. Okay, so if I'm understanding you correctly through you, Mr. Chair, it sounds like this is essentially baked into the procedure already, is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, and um, baked in in the sense that we are relying on the Heritage Committee and their review of, of requests and the issuing of a Heritage Permit to, to deal with those issues. Okay, thank you. Councilor Rich. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you. So, if based off of Councillor uh, Stevens' uh, questions and the response from staff, I'm not sure that this amendment is necessary. Um, but I, I have some questions around the potential of applying murals to heritage properties in general. So there's there's as I understand the procedure there, this has to go through heritage approval first, correct? Okay, and then they cannot apply mural uh, materials to specific, like to brick or, or limestone as well, that's right. And if there were to install a space to put the mural on that would be in front of the property, like a, with a space as per described in the amendment, would that also need to be considered through Heritage as well? Like, the whole process would have to go through the Heritage Committee, is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, that is my understanding, yes. Um, so, I, I, I hear the concerns from, uh, from, con from constituents uh, or, or representatives of Heritage about this, um, and I'm, I'm happy to defer to my council colleagues about this. But I, I must say that part of, part of what I have experienced in my travels and looking at murals in other places is, is part of the excitement of, of art being applied uh, is, is a bit of the sense of the freedom about it and attractiveness as well. So I just wanted to highlight that before we um, continue discussing the in-depth policy about uh, mural application and uh, approvals, so thank you. Deputy Mayor Amos. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you. I really don't have much to add. I, it sounds like there is a process already in place and that um, what is being proposed as an amendment is already happening. So I, I don't know if this is a relevant amendment, I just, it sounds like the mechanisms are there. So, thanks. Anyone else? Councilor Sanic, final words? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, um, I think I made a typo at the, the very last word, um, instead of it being space, should be spacer with an R at the end. It's um, spacer, if that makes sense. Um, I, don't, I can't see the motion anymore but i think um it's a separated with the spacer now yeah with the spacer thank you um i don't want to put all the onus on the heritage committee because as we know the heritage committee um it changes like every year you know people come on people come off um something could be something could be lost right um like these this is who suggested this tonight right is um a renowned architect who uh is very adept right with um our heritage 
characteristics in, in Kingston, you know, years and years of experience. And then we have Miss Bailey, who is, you know, like in charge of, um, of the heritage, um, like foundation in Kingston. And so um, I just, and then this amendment will then carry on forever. It can always be changed, but, you know, it can carry on forever. And then that takes some of the responsibility, you know, uh, away from the Heritage Committee to go, oh, yeah, like, that's right. We were supposed to have said a spacer, like, <laughs> you know, I like guess current right now, but like this could be lost in time, uh, you know, as different Heritage um, Committee members come on and off, right? I just want to get this right now. Um, going forward. So, um, and also the Heritage Committee, they can still look after all the other, you know, um, heritage areas in the city. Like this amendment is specific just to lower Princess Street. The Heritage Committee can then, you know, be responsible for getting it right for all the other um, buildings outside of the lower Princess Heritage character area. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk, for changing it to spacer. Thank you. Can we see that on the screen again, please? Okay. So I'll call the vote on the amendment. All those in favor? Pass you absolutely. Now I'll call a vote on the motion with the amendment. All those in favor? Pass it unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to number item number B, report received from the Arts Advisory Committee to the chair of the members of the Arts and Recreation Committee's Policies Committee. Uh, the Arts Advisory Committee reports and recommends the following for their March, from their March 9th, 2023 meeting. One, points to the local music working group that the Arts and Recreation Committee Policy Committee recommend to Council that Councillor Shaves, Elena Baker, Darren Bryan, Brianna Franklin, Deanna Jansen, Josh Lyon, and Georgina Riel be appointed to the local music working group and that Mark Garnes and Les Kaysan be appointed as the alternate pool to the Arts Advisory Committee members for the local music working group. And two, points to the Arts Public Places Working Group that the Arts Recreation Co Community Policies Committee recommend to Council that Alicia Butler, Jin Jong, Marjo Courier, Nicole Daniels, N. Har Harson, Jan Geronimus, Aaron McCauley, and Devin Armstrong be appointed to the Arts and Public Places Working Group and that Christine Wojcik be appointed to, to the alternate pool of the Arts Advisory members for the Art and Public Places Working Group. Uh, if we can get a mover and seconder, please. Councillor Stephen. Councillor Sanic. <laughs> Call the vote. All those in favor? Pass it unanimously. Uh, there are no motions, no notices of motion. No other business. Correspondence is on the addendum. Their next meeting is currently scheduled for Thursday, May 18th, 2023 at 6 p.m. Adjournment, mover seconder. Deputy Mayor Amos and Council Ridge. All those in favor? Pass your name, meeting adjourned.